Good morning and welcome. My name is Stacy Metcalf and I am the Director of Western Region Government and Community Relations at ANOVA. And I'm proud to serve as the 2020 Chair of the Loudoun Chamber of Commerce and the Chamber's Public Policy Committee. Before we get to our program, I would like to take a moment to ask you all to join me to commemorate the Juneteenth holiday, which is now observed by Virginia's and Loudoun County's governments. Juneteenth is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the legal abolishment of slavery in the United States. It was on June 19, 1865, when Union soldiers landed at Galveston, Texas, with news that the war had ended and that America's enslaved were now free. This was two and a half years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation became official on January 1st, 1863. Let us join together in a moment of silent reflection as we commemorate this holiday and reflect on the affliction of, of slavery and the indelible mark it has left on our nation even today. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual policymaker series event, Housing the Region's Workforce. Loudoun County's housing crisis represents just a piece of the larger crisis that is facing the entire DC metro region. Our businesses rely on multiple jurisdictions to provide housing that is affordable for all employees. Regional organizations such as the Council of Governments have determined the full scope of the issue. Now it is time for our leadership to work in cooperation to bring a dramatic change to our region. Some housekeeping notes before we start. I wanna give you permission to be on your phones this morning, but only for one reason, to share with your many social media followers your thoughts on today's program. And when you do so, please use the hashtag LCCPolicy. That's L followed by three Cs and the word policy. We also have another hashtag that we'd love for you to use, and that is hashtag summer of policy because this is the first of three policymaker webinars that we'll be hosting this summer. And please also remember to always tag the chamber at Loudon Chamber. I would also like to let everybody know that we will have a curated Q&A session after we hear from our esteemed panel. And provided we have time, we will turn to the audience for additional questions. Therefore, if you have questions, submit them in the Q&A box below your screen, and we will get to as many questions as we can this morning. I would like to recognize our sponsors next. Today's event and our entire policymaker series would not be made possible without the generous support of our sponsors. First, thank you to our signature series sponsor, which is My Hospital Home, Inova Loudon Hospital. We are proud to support the Chamber and the Policymakers series. Our mission is to provide world-class healthcare every time, every touch to each person, excuse me, to each person in every community we have the privilege to serve. For over 100 years, we have been your neighbors taking care of neighbors, and now more than ever, we are here for the Loudoun community. Over the past three months, we've been especially appreciative of the Loudoun Chamber and the whole community for your support and love of our frontline heroes during this unprecedented time. You have been our neighbors taking care of us, and we are grateful. Next, I would like to give a big round of applause to our spotlight sponsor, Langhorn Custom Homes, who we will be hearing from in just a little bit. Please also join me in recognizing our advocate sponsors for the 2020 Policymaker Series. They are Access Point Public Affairs, Backflow Technology, Bank of Clark County, BCT, the Communities Bank, McGuire Woods Consulting, Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, Modern Mechanical, the National Sports Institute, Northern Virginia Community College, Toth Financial Advisory Corporation, and Uninet. I would also like to recognize our enterprise sponsor for their invaluable support. Our enterprise sponsors are Atlantic Union Bank, the Community Foundation of Loudoun and Northern Fauquier Counties, Comstock, Dominion Energy, Junalia Research Campus, Sandy Spring Bank, Telos, and the George Washington University Science and Technology Campus. It is now my pleasure to also rec um, recognize our Chamber's 2020 business partner, the Economic Development Authority of Loudoun County, and our 2020 community partner, the Loudoun County Department of Economic Development. Also, please thank me, thank, please join me in thanking our media sponsor, Loudoun Now. I would also like to give a very special thank you and welcome to our elected officials who have joined us here today. They include US Senator Tim Kaine, and from the Virginia General Assembly, please welcome Senator Jennifer Boisco, Delegate Dave LaRock, 
Delegate Ibrahim Samira, Delegate Carrie Delaney, and Delegate Wendy Gaditis. And from the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors, please welcome Chair Phyllis Randall, Supervisor Mike Turner, and Supervisor Kristen Umstead. Your leadership is very much appreciated today and every day. I would also like to thank the members of the Loudoun Chamber Board of Directors. I am blessed to have an opportunity to work with each and every one of you, and I thank you for being here today. At this time, it's my privilege to recognize our spotlight sponsor for today's program, Langhorn Custom Homes, and invite Vice Chair of our Public Policy Committee and Chamber Board Member, Kirsten Langhorn, to offer a few remarks. Kirsten. Thanks, Stacy. I really appreciate it. Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Um, I wanna thank the Chamber for this opportunity. I wanna thank the panelists for your work on this issue. Uh, it's hard work and I really value uh, everything you do to support affordable housing in our region. Um, so let me introduce my business. Langhorn Custom Homes is a Loudoun-based uh, custom home builder. We are currently enjoying and very thankful for um, more work than we've ever had. And uh, again, really appreciative for that. Um, we are actively seeking new projects for 2021. So if you are considering uh, entering the process of building a custom home, we'd love to talk to you. We focus on transparency, integrity, and commitment to quality. I'm also participating in this uh, conversation today as a mom and a community member. As a mom, I'm very, very proud of my recent college grad who is currently applying for career firefighting positions. This issue of housing affordability is going to be very real for him and we're having those conversations already. Um, he's being very thoughtful about it, but it is a barrier to where he might be able to uh, develop his career. Um, I'm also speaking as a community member who, uh, my husband and I, 2008, 2009, when the housing market here was pretty scary for us, uh, we, considered moving out of the area and the thing that kept us here was our county's diversity. I can't emphasize how important that is to us and to um, so many of our friends and I would hate for economic wealth to become a permanent barrier to maintaining and improving that diversity we enjoy here that adds so much to the social wealth of our county. So I'm hoping that these conversations lead to some really good conversations about how we can support housing diversity um, and the general cl um, climate that that creates for us. I wanna be here in 30 years, learning from all of you, my fascinating, hardworking, caring neighbors. So thank you very much, Stacey. Thanks for this opportunity. And I look forward to hearing what we can today, thanks. Thank you again, Kirsten, for serving on our public policy committee and for being our spotlight sponsor today. It is now my honor to introduce our U.S. Senator from Virginia, Tim Kaine, who has stopped by to spend a few minutes with us this morning. Senator Kaine was elected to the Senate in 2012 and serves on the Armed Services, Budget, Foreign Relations, and Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committees. As co-chair of the Bipartisan Career and Technical Education Caucus, Senator Kane focuses on expanding access to job training programs to ensure that students of all ages are prepared with skills they need for the jobs in the modern economy. He has also led successful efforts in the Senate to reduce unemployment for military families and veterans. He was first elected to office in 1994, serving as city council member and then mayor of Richmond. He became Lieutenant Governor of Virginia in 2002 and was inaugurated as Virginia's 70th governor in 2006. He is married to Ann Holton, who served as Virginia Secretary of Education from 2014 to 2016, and currently teaches education policy and government at George Mason University. They both revel in the adventures of their three grown children and live in the same North Side Richmond neighborhood where they moved in as newlyweds more than 30 years ago. Everybody, please, Join me in giving a big warm welcome to U.S. Senator Tim Kaine. Stacey, thank you very much. It's great to be part of this dialogue today. And um, I remember so well being together with you in person last year and only regret that we can't do it in person again this year. But I, I'm happy to come and offer a few opening comments. First, 
just an expression of sympathy, solidarity, uh, concern for everybody on this call. This is a very challenging time in our nation's life. This pandemic uh, has health effects. And so I know probably each of you in your own way have worries about your own health or the health of people you love. Uh, it has economic effects and I'm sure you and family members, everybody on this call have been affected by the economic challenges of the last few months. Um, and as we're seeing, especially on Juneteenth, um, protests expressing deep felt, long held, sincere concerns about law enforcement activities regarding our communities of color, especially African American communities, together with the other items, um, health effects and job losses that are falling hardest on minority communities, it's a very challenging time. If you had told me three months ago that my wife and I would both have had coronavirus, that two of our three adult children would be laid off work because their jobs have closed, uh, and we would have known four people, three Virginians who died of coronavirus, I would have said, you gotta be kidding me. Because we're fortunate people with good jobs and good health care and a good safety net of friends and family, but that is in fact what has happened to us. And while we're better now, and uh, you know, thank goodness our cases were mild and our kids have a safety net that can back them up, it's given me a deep, deep appreciation for how difficult this time is for people who don't have the resources or the health care or the housing that I have. Uh, a year ago when we were together, we were talking about the housing needs in the DC area and in Loudoun driven by this upsurge in economic investment. And I remember talking a little bit about what the Amazon investment uh, might mean uh, in terms of housing costs. Um, as as uh, Kristen talked about her son, a high school graduate thinking about housing, and that could be a barrier for him. And we were talking about those barriers. Um, today, there's a different issue that's facing us, and I hope and expect that panelists will get into it, uh, and particularly because state legislators will be addressing it in some likelihood in a special session in um, in the Virginia General Assembly, just as we are trying to address it at the federal level. Um, in the CARES Act that we passed at the end of March, bipartisan, sizable investment to try to deal with both the health and economic emergencies, we put some significant provisions to try to assist people in the housing needs that are driven by this time. We put a moratorium on evictions for reasons of rent payment on all properties that utilize federal funding until July 27th. Uh, we established a right to up to 12 months of forbearance for homeowners with mortgages backed by the FHA, USDA, VA, Fannie, or Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Um, and then we also established a right to 90 days of forbearance for multifamily property owners who have federally backed mortgages uh, with the requirement that they couldn't evict for non-payment during that time and for an additional 120 days after that forbearance period ended. So we tried to act quickly to uh, forestall both evictions and foreclosures, but that was a temporary solution. Um, if people are lifted of the burden of paying rent for a short period of time, it doesn't mean that those who own properties, for example, don't have ongoing mortgage obligations and ongoing operating expenses, for example, to manage properties. Those expenses continue. You you don't want properties to not be managed well and become unsafe when people are living there. So now we're grappling with having passed four pieces of sizable legislation, including some of these housing provisions, we're grappling with what to do next. Um, and either in the next two weeks or in the two weeks following the 4th of July recess, I expect that we'll do a fifth coronavirus related package. And I am advocating strongly uh, for housing related um, measures and not just continuing to protect against eviction and foreclosure, uh, but actual direct dollars to individuals so that they can pay rent or pay mortgages if they've economically suffered. That would then enable um, the mortgages to stay current um, and those who are managing rental properties to have the dollars they need to be able to um, safely maintain and operate those properties. Um, the way to look at what we've done in Congress with respect to coronavirus is we've made investments in five pillars, um, aid to individuals, aid to small businesses. 100,000 small businesses in Virginia have received PPP loans totaling more than $12 billion. Loans to large businesses, 
aid to state and local government, and then finally, maybe most importantly, aid to hospitals, nursing homes, and other healthcare institutions, because this is at base an economic challenge driven by a public health emergency. I think it's basically time to refill the individual and family aid bucket and also to refill the state and local government aid bucket. We refilled the small business bucket at the end of April and we also provided a lot more dollars for hospitals and healthcare institutions. Now we need to do the same for individuals and families and state and local governments. And I'm very committed as we think about individuals and families, even more important than unemployment insurance benefits or a direct payment. I now think the most important thing is targeted resources to help people with housing, to help people with food insecurity, because that is a growing challenge as explained by food banks all over the state as I talk to them, uh, and, then, and then also healthcare. I, I hope we could provide some direct relief to people who need it in those areas, um, and then do other things that it will encourage them to start back to work as the economy is reopening. Uh, but the housing needs are significant. I had a meeting with housing, Zoom meeting with housing activists all over the Commonwealth yesterday, uh, both uh, working with state government and working with other housing organizations. And they are seeing a massive backlog of potential evictions uh, because of a state moratorium on evictions coupled with the federal moratorium. It doesn't mean that there won't be evictions. It just means that we push them down the road. They're seeing a massive backlog of evictions that can start up again if we don't provide assistance. So to Loudon, I always love doing events together with chambers because when I was in local office, my chamber was so helpful on policy development. The fact that you have identified and then continue to pay attention to housing needs in your community is, a, is laudable. It means you're focusing on a priority where we definitely need all hands on deck to come up with solutions. Uh, you've got my word that I'm gonna do all I can having uh, been part of the uh, CARES Act package that provided the initial housing relief. I'm gonna do all I can to provide additional housing relief in the next coronavirus bill we pass. And I think coupled together with what the state might do at a special session of the General Assembly in August, we can try to provide some safety net of protection uh, for renters, for those who own rental properties and for homeowners as well. And with that, Stacy, thank you for letting me sign in at the beginning. Um, I wish you guys have a have a, a great session today and, and I'll look forward to seeing you in person when we safely can. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Kane, for sharing your insights with us today. And I'm glad that you mentioned that last year we were able to be together because when I was driving in today, I was I was a little sad that, that we wouldn't be together, but we so appreciate you coming and stopping by and please stay as long as you can and um, we'll go ahead and continue the program now. It is my pleasure now to kick off the panel discussion with Nina Janapal, Tom Fleetwood, and Stephen Wilson. We will first hear from Nina Janapal and let me give you her bio first, um, which is so impressive. As Executive Director of the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing, Ms. Janapal oversees all elements of their real estate development, operations, advocacy, services, and governance. During her tenure, APAH has grown its portfolio from 15 multifamily rental properties with to 1,360 plus units valued with valued at almost 250 million with another 800 units in development. APAH is known for its nimble and effective real estate development for pioneering innovative supportive housing partnerships and community impact. Under Ms. Janapal's leadership, APAH has received numerous awards, including the Charles Edson Award for Best Urban Development in the Country, the Urban Land Institute, DC's Best Housing Project, Developer of the Year from the Housing Association of Nonprofit Developers, Best Nonprofit by the Arlington Chamber of Commerce, and the Arlington Community Foundation's Prize for Impact and Innovation. Before joining APAH, Ms. Janapal was a principal at Capital Strategies Consulting, Inc., and provided many services to a variety of organizations, including enterprise community partners. Prior to 2000, she was the National Director for Development for the Hosteling International USA, formerly American Youth Hostels. Ms. Janapal received a Bachelor of Arts magna cum laude from Harvard University, and she serves the Virginia, um, the Virginia Housing Development Authority's Northern Virginia Advisory Committee. 
She is the past president of HAND, a regional housing association, and received the Virginia Housing Coalition's 2013 Innovations and Leadership Award. Please join me in welcoming Nina Janapal. Thank you so much, Stacey. It's such a delight to be here, and thank you for that glowing introduction. Um, I want to just start by thanking you also, Stacy, for that mention of Juneteenth and how important it is that all of us recognize how the coronavirus has had these differential impacts for people of color and that this is an opportunity for us to really step up and affordable housing is at the forefront of that. Let me share this PowerPoint. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Uh, again, I work with the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing. We work throughout the DC area, um, including in Loudoun. Um, and I want to stop, start with talking about the historic legacy of housing policy that has created racially segregated communities and has kept people of color from building wealth and from living in high opportunity areas. So I so loved that um, Kirsten said at the beginning of this session that she loved the diversity of Loudoun and that's what drew her here. And I think we all need to step up and make sure that we are thinking about the racial impacts of all the land use and finance policies in our community. And I highly recommend this book here, um, Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, which explicitly talks about government policies that created unequal opportunities. And affordable housing is one way we can create more opportunity for people of color. Now, last fall, two important reports were issued, um, both connected with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, um, of which Loudoun is a member. Uh, the Urban Institute studied the constraints on our economy by housing affordability and how the lack of supply coupled with regional growth has been pushing up rents and it predicted that inaction on housing affordability could ultimately undermine the region's future economic prosperity. Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments took that study and issued their own. They estimated 413,000 new jobs to be created in the Metro DC area. Of course, this was pre-COVID. Maybe this is changing, let's hope not, um, between 2020 and 2030, but only 245,000 housing units are planned over that same period. This is, this is a crisis that's already in the making and they're predicting it will get worse. So what did they say? We need to have three targets. Target one is create more housing units. Target two is 75% of those housing units should be in what they've defined as activity centers. So walkable communities, places where um, people can live uh, near services and near transit. And number three, and this is a big one, this was new, 75% of that new housing should be affordable to low and middle income households. Now here's a little bit of how we got here. Over the last 20 years, housing costs have risen twice as fast as income. So you can see, you know, this, is a, this, this disparity has created quite a crisis and that's illustrated here in Loudoun, which has had the highest increase in median rent by county for the region over the last eight years, 11%. Now who is burdened by that? Well, the people most burdened are those earning under $35,000 a year. You can see that um, this looks at uh, the percentage of household income spent, the gray bars, are folks that are spending over 50% of their income on housing. Well, it's, six, it's two thirds, almost three quarters, or over three quarters for people that earn less than $35,000 a year. That challenge disappears here at 75,000 a year. So this is a true burden for people in our community. And Loudoun is part of that. 74% of renters in Loudoun County are housing cost burdened, as we call it. Um, the population grew by 32% over the last decade. That's exciting and wonderful. But how, what happened? That meant that Loudoun has the tightest rental market in the region with only 3.8% vacancy and median rents of 16, 18. Now, who does that leave out? Who can't afford a rent of 16, 18? Well, our food preparation and service staff who earn an average salary of about 20,000, 
are construction workers with an average salary of about 37,000. These are well below the median household income in Loudoun County, which is, a, as you all know, probably one of the highest in the country at 140,000. Um, but these are an important part of our economy too. Now here's what COG came up with and said we need to do to address this issue. And this is for the entire region. And I, I highlighted here the first two goals. We need, this is an amazing number, 140,000 units by 2030 that serve people at rents below 1300 a month. These are, these are affordable rents. These are rents that need subsidy to be possible in our community. You can't build market units at that. I think that's striking, but I think what's also striking is looking down here at rents over 2,500. COG says you only need about 22% of the housing stock you produce to be in that price point. So, there, so there's also a need for middle range housing. So how do we create more middle range housing and more affordable housing to serve that need? Um, I also wanna talk about Loudoun's specific targets. <coughs> Excuse me. The Urban Institute broke out each community. I have Fairfax here because I know the next speaker is Tom Fleetwood from Fairfax County. Um, but Loudoun County's goals, according to the Urban Institute, are 8,600 housing units needed at those low rent price points by 2030. Now, if you produce those equally over the period of this study, that'd be six, almost 600 units a year. How do you get there? How do you get to 600 units a year? Um, COG says that you need a portfolio of policy tools. You need to look at your regulatory authority, that is mostly land use policies, but, but also some others, permitting, um, and your funding resources and your leadership capacities. And the goal should be to produce more housing across the affordability spectrum and to preserve existing affordable housing, but also to protect households from discrimination and instability. We know that the cost of homelessness is quite high, which is why people like Senator Kane are really focusing on that rent relief program. We as a nation can't afford to have people sliding into homelessness. So let me start with the funding tools. The biggest funding tool in the nation for affordable housing is the low income housing tax credit. It has produced 3 million homes since 1987. There is currently bipartisan legislation to boost that program and Senator Kane is one of the sponsors of that. So thank you. Um, this is a program run competitively by the state, the Virginia Housing Development Authority. Loudoun has positioned itself well to be successful in that, but that, that is a tool that needs to be used to make housing affordability. There's also a state housing trust fund. Thank you to our um, legislators who um, proposed increasing it. That was pulled back, but hopefully that will only be temporary. And Loudoun has, as you all know, its own trust fund, very important part of creating affordable housing. So let me pivot a little bit to land use tools. What land use tools do you need, does COG think, and, and have I learned through my experience in running APA to create affordable housing? Well, an important piece of this is the bonus density program. And Loudoun has a, a, a robust program for that. And APA is actually participating in that. I'll tell you a little more about that project in a minute, our Mount Sterling Senior Project, um, part of a 22 acre mixed income property. Another tool is affordable housing on public land or co-located with public facilities. I think Fairfax is a leader in this. You'll hear more about that from Tom Fleetwood and APA is honored to be working with Fairfax on a project there. I don't believe Loudoun has done much in this area. That's a growth potential. Um, increasing density at existing affordable housing. Um, this is a project here, APA's Queens Court project. This was a one acre site <coughs> that had 39 garden apartments on it. We have bulldozed that and we are um, two thirds of the way through building this beautiful 12 story building with 249 apartments. Are there places on the urban fringe where you can take an existing garden apartment complex and produce significantly more? These will be 100% affordable units. Another tool, again, I'm not sure <coughs> Loudon has done this much, is partnering with civic properties. Um, nationwide, we're seeing more and more houses of worship engage in partnering with affordable housing. Apple worked with uh, the Arlington Presbyterian Church to create this beautiful property, Gilliam Place, 173 units. It opened last year. As they're seeing declining Sunday attendance, this is an opportunity to increase mission and do something new and sometimes revitalize an aging property. Um, we also are a pioneer in one of the first in the country to work with a veteran serving organization 
to do affordable housing. We just broke ground uh, four weeks ago um, on the American Legion Post 139 in Arlington to create, this is a diagram of what it will look like to Williger Place in Arlington, and it will have veterans preference housing as well. So I think those are all land use tools the county could focus more on. Um, I did see in the attendee list, um, uh, Sarah Etro, uh, thank you, Sarah, for your leadership in Loudoun County. And I know you're working on an unmet housing study. And I think that's got an opportunity to really use these tools. The third piece that Cog said you need to meet this affordable housing challenge is leadership. And it's so wonderful that the Loudoun Chamber is a partner in this. I was honored to speak last year on a panel with Senator Kane on a similar conversation and that you're continuing to have this conversation in the community. It really needs to be a three part uh, conversation between the nonprofit community, the private sector and the public sector. And I just want to close with a couple words about APA. Um, here's some current information about how many units we have. We have another 700 units in development. Um, as Stacy said, we're committed to not just developing affordable housing, but advocating for affordable housing and social justice for our low income neighborhoods. We house seniors, families, persons with disabilities, they have important housing needs, and the formerly homeless. Um, and we provide programs to keep our families stable. And I will say at this time, our program staff are busier than ever because again, as Senator Kane mentioned, there's a lot of food insecurity. About 17% of our households are out of work and unable to pay their rent, and they have no money for food as well. So we've been partnering with food banks, partnering with healthcare providers. A lot of them lost their health insurance, um, access to healthcare with losing their jobs, um, and keeping those families stable. So that's an important part of our mission, and we are thrilled to hear that the Senator is committed to doing more for rent relief in the upcoming months. Um, I was very committed to um, its real estate approach, which I just want to say is both mission minded. You know, we look at serving the, the lowest income households and those in need, um, but also we're very community engaged. We want to listen to the neighborhoods and be a good neighbor, produce beautiful buildings. This is um, one we opened two years ago that are a real complement to the community. So diversity, affordability and beautiful neighborhoods can all be done together. Um, and I said I was going to give a little more detail here. Uh, this is our partnership with Fairfax County on public land. This is so exciting because this was an um, intersection of a uh, major road, um, Van Dorn and 495, where there was sort of an underutilized pond and uh, stormwater pond. And the county had the vision, and then they ran a competition, and APA was honored to be selected uh, to create affordable housing on this site. So we hope to break ground in a year. We are being supported by a ground lease, of course, from the county, $5 million in housing blueprint funds, the low income housing tax credits, I mentioned that federal program, uh, as well as um, some other tools, hope to break ground in a year. And here's a little bit of information on our Loudoun project, 98 units of independent senior housing. This is a joint venture with Edmondson and Gallagher. And we've also partnered with Mike Capetti, who assembled the land for this 22 acre mixed income site. Um, and we received tax credits on that last year and a Loudoun Ho County Housing Trust Fund allocation. And we hope to break ground on that uh, soon this fall. We're a little delayed because of COVID, but it will be coming soon. So thank you all for your time and for your interest in this topic. Thank you, Nina, for joining us this morning. And um, I look forward to our Q&A session, so please stay on the line. Um, every time I hear you speak, I just learn something new, and I know that the audience did too, so thank you. Um, next up is Tom Fleetman, Fleetwood, and I'm very, very um, excited to introduce him. Tom was appointed um, the Director of Fairfax County Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, in March of 2016. Mr. Fleetwood has more than 15 years of experience in the field of housing and community development and has been with HCD since 2005. He has served a number of roles within the agency, including strategic planner, associate director for the Fairfax County Redevelopment and Housing Authority, and their director of policy, reporting, and communications, and an acting director. Mr. Fleetwood developed the award-winning Housing Blueprint and Affordable Housing Policy endorsed by the Board of Supervisors, which guides the county's affordable housing efforts in the community. 
The blueprint focuses on serving those with the greatest need, including homeless families and individuals, persons with disabilities, and people with extremely low incomes. Mr. Fleetwood was awarded Fairfax County's prestigious A. Heath On Thank Award in 2012 and the Conrad Egan Excellence Award for Service in 2014 and was recognized as one of Housing, of Housing Virginia's top 40 under 40 in 2012. He has a bachelor's degree in interdepartmental studies from West Virginia University and attended the Senior Executive Institute Cooper Center for Public Service at the University of Virginia in 2013. Please join me in giving a big warm welcome to Mr. Tom Fleetwood to our virtual stage. Thank you very much, Stacey, for that uh, incredibly kind introduction. And let me first say uh, also thank you to the Loudoun Chamber. I am uh, thrilled to be here. Stacy talked about this as truly a regional issue and as your regional partner here in Fairfax County, uh, we look, uh, look forward to continuing to work together to address this common challenge. Um, I'm also honored to, uh, to be on the panel both uh, with Nina and with Steve Wilson who are doing just incredible work in our community uh, every day. So thank you very much indeed. Now, if I can share my screen and not mess it up, um, I'm gonna start my presentation. Right, so I'll, I'll, I'll start just a little bit with a snapshot of the, of the conditions in Fairfax County. Uh, we've identified a need for 15,000 net new homes uh, for families earning 60% of the median income and below over the next 15 years. Uh, we have about 30,000 low and moderate income renter families who are cost burdened, and there are about 71,000 households living in Fairfax County right now uh, who earn $50,000 a year or less. And our continually rising rents and stagnant incomes means that Fairfax County's housing market is not uh, is out of reach uh, for our low and moderate income workforce, which certainly poses a significant challenge uh, for our businesses in attracting and retaining employees uh, and for the county in attracting and retaining businesses. So we've been having a conversation in Fairfax County over the last uh, three years about housing affordability as we've, as we've developed an affordable housing plan and really, we've uh, come to a conclusion as a community that housing really uh, is the foundation for three critical uh, pillars for community success. Uh, number one, it serves as the platform for individual and family well-being. Uh, it supports local economic growth, and it's the basis, really the cornerstone of inclusive and diverse communities. With respect to uh, sustainable economic growth, uh, again, a healthy housing market that provides opportunities for all levels of income. Uh, it helps people live and work, uh, live in the communities where they work. Uh, it makes it easier to attract and retain workers. It reduces income segregation uh, and broadens the county's tax base. Nina shared some data as well uh, with respect to the dis uh, disparity between income growth and rents. And this is a snapshot, a little bit of a different cut uh, than what Nina had for Fairfax County. Uh, so between 2010 and 2015, uh, the change in household incomes uh, was 10%. But as you can see on the left there, uh, rents increased by 17%, which is an, uh, an unsustainable disparity in our community. Uh, like Nina, I've got just a little bit of a snapshot of the kinds of workers that we're talking about uh, who are increasingly priced out of our, uh, of our housing market. Uh, retail sales, security guards, accountants, uh, really the whole panoply of, uh, of uh, low and moderate income jobs that are essential uh, to, making our, to making our common economy work. So what are the tools we have in Fairfax County and what are the approaches that we're taking? Um, one of the most important tools we, that we have in Fairfax County is that we have a redevelopment and housing authority. Uh, it's a separate political subdivision of the Commonwealth uh, that was established by the voters 
1966 by the landslide margin of 150 votes, I might add. Um, and since that time, it's really become the preeminent provider of affordable housing in the county, and it acts as the county's local housing finance agency. The Department of Housing and Community Development, which I lead, acts as the administrative staff to the Redevelopment and Housing Authority, and on its behalf really manages its three principal activities, which are affordable housing finance and development, rental assistance, and the affordable housing communities that we own and operate. Just a little bit about our impact in the community. On any given day, um, about 20,000 people are living in housing that is provided directly by the Redevelopment and Housing Authority here in Fairfax County. Uh, and we have countless more that are living in privately owned housing developed with uh, FCRHA financing and FCRHA land uh, in partnership with developers like uh, APA and SCG, Steve Wilson's organization, and numerous others. Across all of our housing programs, the average income that we served is 26,000 a year. And if you think about what that means uh, for a family living in Fairfax County, living in our region, they would not be able to be here but for uh, these programs. I'm also really proud to say that about a third of the families that are served in our programs include at least one person with a disability. And finally, uh, we, are, uh, we are playing a very important role as we meet the challenge of homelessness in Fairfax County. About 75% of the households uh, that come out of our homeless system go into long-term affordable housing uh, that is provided for uh, by FCRHA resources. Just to kind of give you an idea of the diversity of housing uh, that, the, that the Housing Authority owns and operates, um, just wanted to show you this very briefly, includes uh, senior uh, properties, licensed assisted living, multifamily garden style apartments, as well as apartments that are interspersed into, uh, into market affordable projects across the county. So just looking to the future uh, in terms of our, of our planning, um, the Board of Supervisors has adopted a housing and affordable housing strategic plan that calls for a minimum goal of 5,000 new affordable units over the next 15 years, and that this is a floor, not a ceiling. The board also adopted a recommendation uh, to provide for the equivalent of one additional penny of our real estate tax rate uh, to be dedicated to affordable housing development. Now, the advent of COVID-19 uh, has delayed the implementation of that investment, but we uh, remain very hopeful uh, that we'll be able to move that forward in the near future. Finally, we're also, uh, we're also uh, looking at a variety of land use innovations that help, can help amplify our activities uh, towards that 5,000 unit goal. The board also, adopt, also reaffirmed its commitment that there should be no net loss of existing market affordable units uh, in properties that are being redeveloped and that this will be achieved through a combination of public investment uh, and, um, and uh, land use policy. We're also, as Nina mentioned, very aggressive in the field of public-private partnerships uh, using both our inclusionary zoning policies and our public land. With respect to our inclusionary zoning policies, we were a leader uh, in adopting an affordable dwelling unit program in 1990, uh, which has produced almost 3,000 units uh, since, since its inception. That is a mandatory program under our zoning ordinance. Uh, in 2007, we adopted a companion program in our comprehensive plan uh, our workforce dwelling unit program, which has produced uh, about 1,600 units uh, across the county, about half of which are actually in the Tyson's Corner Urban Center. And this is a proper based incentives uh, system within our comprehensive plan. As Nina mentioned, uh, and as I said earlier, we've been very aggressive with public-private partnerships uh, using the PPEA Act uh, as, a, as a vehicle uh, to be able to really maximize the value of uh, publicly owned land generally and uh, land owned by the Redevelopment and Housing Authority in particular. 
one of our marquee projects was developed by uh, Stratford Capital, uh, Mr. Wilson's organization, uh, and is located on the campus of the Fairfax County Government Center here in Fairfax County. Uh, it, is, it has won multiple national and state awards as, uh, as really a leader in developing uh, workforce housing. Uh, and I'm also proud to say that it is visible from all of the offices of our decision makers uh, in Fairfax County. Uh, and they can see uh, every day and our citizens can see every day what high quality, uh, well executed affordable housing looks like. So I mentioned uh, we have our 5,015 year minimum goal uh, and we are anticipating new investment um, uh, when, we, uh, when we were able to get past the challenge of COVID-19. We have a commitment to no net loss, land use policy, and we have a great pipeline. I wanna talk a little bit about our pipeline. Uh, we've just recently delivered in partnership with Wesley Housing, the Falstead at Lewinsville Center, which is, uh, which is uh, up here on the left-hand corner. That's located in McLean. And Wesley was able to deliver 82 uh, units of senior affordable housing uh, and Fairfax County delivered a brand new public facility, which included a senior center and adult day uh, healthcare center and two childcare centers. One university, which is the one on the lower right, uh, just, uh, just won its low income housing tax, credit, uh, tax credits this year. Uh, and as a partnership between the Housing Authority, Stratford Capital Group, and RISE Student Housing, and we'll deliver uh, 207, two, pardon me, 240 units of affordable housing, plus nearly 800 beds of student housing uh, adjacent to the campus of uh, George Mason University right here in Fairfax County. Next is uh, uh, the, uh, the legendary North Hill project on Richmond Highway in, uh, in uh, the southern part of Fairfax County. Uh, it closed, the transaction closed uh, two weeks ago and they will be under construction very shortly. They'll be delivering 279 units of affordable housing, affordable rental housing, plus 175 units of market townhouses and a 12 acre passive park. We're very proud to be working with Nina and APA on, the, on Oakwood. Uh, Nina described that to you a little bit earlier, but we're really excited about that one moving forward as well. It's 150 units of senior housing on a, a, uh, on a former stormwater management site. And um, that's the uh, conclusion of my presentation. I'll be uh, glad to answer questions when we get to the Q&A. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tom, for sharing your work, especially in the area of public-private partnerships. We look forward to hearing more from you during the Q&A session. So as I said to Nina, please stay on the line. Um, to round out our panel, it is now my honor to please, to welcome, to have everybody please welcome Mr. Stephen Wilson, who is the founding member and owner of SCG Development and its affiliated company, Stratford Capital Group. Mr. Wilson is primarily involved with the management and oversight of the company's property development activities. Prior to forming Stratford Capital, he was a senior member of the Franklin Capital Group, where he was primarily responsible for the supervision of all development projects. He has a broad development experience managing numerous types of projects that include ground up construction, moderate and substantial rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of historic structures. Prior to joining Franklin Capital Group in 1997, he served as the president of the Dulles Estate Real Estate Corporation, a private Washington DC area firm that is specialized in commercial real estate and provided general advisory services to its clients, including project feasibility, analysis, financing, budgetary review, marketing, development management, leasing, and sales. He is an appointed board member of the Loudoun County Housing Advisory Board and is a graduate of the University of Richmond with a bachelor's degree in finance and holds an MBA from the George Washington University. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Stephen Wilson. The, uh, I'm trying to get in here, but the host has got to allow the uh, video, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Steve says you cannot start your video because the host has. Sorry, Steve. We are working on, okay, 
Thank you. Okay, everybody, big warm welcome. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, pleased to spend a few minutes with you here learning and talking about affordable housing and the various challenges. Uh, certainly, as everybody has described, we're in uh, unprecedented territory. Um, our, uh, our corporate view on this and my personal view is it's a, uh, you know, when, when uh, people and nations are under stress, um, you know, certain, uh, certain uh, positive things emerge from that, uh, namely change, creativity, innovation, drive. Um, as you can tell, I'm an optimist. And so, you know, without that kind of attitude, um, it really, uh, it's, it is an, an incredible time, but I think frankly, uh, over the next 12 to 24 months, uh, the country as a whole is gonna come out uh, stronger on many, many fronts. Um, with respect to all the things that we've been encountering. So um, while it's a challenging time, it's also a, a time for improvement and in, uh, in innovation. Um, I put together a, a fairly uh, simple slideshow here. Um, that I think everybody can see, is that true? Can everybody see that? Yes, Steve, we see it. Thank you. Okay. So what, um, what I wanted to talk about today is um, a lot of things that we have talked about. Obviously, the demand is uh, substantial. The, the uh, industry as a whole is facing numerous uh, challenges with respect to funding. And, uh, but again, with all those challenges, our, our opportunities are created. Um, you know, the way when we're looking at uh, developing affordable housing, um, you know, fundamentally, we're trying to solve a math problem. We are in a situation where we are electively agreeing to reduce our rents relative to the market. And when you do that, um, while it's fulfilling a, a necessary and required public good, you're also creating a shortage in sources and uses um, in your total development budget. And, you know, in a very round number for every unit that we're delivering, and this is not, um, this is again, an approximation, but it's, it's roughly accurate. For every unit that we develop, um, we are building into a loss. So when I say that, um, for every unit that we build, just the day that we place it in service, the day that we put the income restriction on it, we're losing about $100,000 a unit. Um, relative to the de development cost of that unit. So that's kind of the, the challenge that we're facing here. Uh, both Nina and Tom had described a little bit on ways on how that, uh, how that shortage is made up through the various mechanisms. Uh, but one constant thread in all of this is all the affordable housing transactions throughout the country rely heavily, if not almost exclusively on the equity capital that's enabled by uh, IRS code section 42, which is the low income housing tax credit, um, subordinate mortgage financing provided by the local jurisdictions, and then there's various other incentives. Just a quick note about the uh, low income housing tax credit. That is, uh, as many of you well know, it's, uh, it's a code section uh, that allows private companies to uh, enjoy a tax credit if they invest in real estate projects that are uh, being rented to people at certain income levels, typically 60% of the area median income or less. Those investors are investing in those transactions and their motivations are, uh, CRA uh, is a big one, but it's also a, a pretty reasonable investment for them on an after tax basis. And so what we're seeing here Again, pre-COVID, the, the total capitalization of our industry was probably 13, 14 billion a year. Pretty substantial number, but frankly, if you look at the total shortage of housing in the country and what we're trying to, to make up here, it's, it's not enough. Um, we're happy with what we have, but we need quite a bit more. Um, the other key component, and this is more, this is somewhat on a national level, but frankly, uh, this is a Loudoun Chamber event with Fairfax uh, and Tom Pleatwood's participation. We, these deals really aren't possible without subordinate financing provided by the local jurisdiction. And those, that financing comes in the shape and configuration and structure of a subordinated mortgage. It's done that way for tax reasons. 
They often have uh, preferential interest rates and repayment terms. Again, those, those are the numbers and the dollars that are going in to fill this roughly $100,000 per unit lost for every unit developed. Um, our, our real challenge now is um, the pot is shrinking, the demand is high. Um, Nina pointed out some staggering statistics about how much housing that we need to create just to make up where we are, much less how we're trying to accommodate uh, for the future growth of the economy. So it's a, it's a constant stress on everybody, including the local jurisdictions. COVID uh, certainly wasn't helpful. Um, I like the word Tom Fleetwood used. I, I underlined it, a deferment of, um, of their commitment to fund affordable housing. Um, I believe Fairfax and, and Loudoun will be back to their uh, hopeful uh, levels uh, in the very short term. And then there's, there's other incentives that are being discussed. Again, a lot of those are you know, at the very local level and at the federal level, but most of the money to make these works comes from Code Section 42, which is allocated through the state of Virginia every year on a highly competitive basis through the 9% credits, both 9 and 4% credits, and then the subordinate mortgage financing. This is a little bit uh, redundant. We've already discussed, I think, people on the call that understand uh, affordable housing, understand Code Section 42. Um, essentially, uh, the Treasury allocates the light, low income housing tax credits annually to each state. Each state then allocates the credits to real estate projects based upon each state's own rule book, which is called their Qualified Allocation Plan. There are two in that each, each state receives an allocation of credits based upon population. So a state like Delaware uh, with a relatively small population gets almost no tax credit. A uh, state like New York and California gets enormous allocation of credits. Virginia gets a, a, a proportional of allocation of credits. But again, this is all I, I view as a good start. It's by no means uh, enough to solve the problems that we're trying to, uh, to solve here. There are two uh, fundamental types of credits here, uh, the 9% credits and the 4% credits. 9% credits are highly competitive. Um, you apply every year. You really have got to game your application to score based upon the uh, rules and objectives of the QAP uh, published at that time. Uh, very, very competitive, probably seven to eight applications for every one that's awarded in the state every year. And that's that's year over year. Um, the other one is the 4% uh, tax credit. Not, it's non-competitively allocated in that they'll take a, a rolling application. Um, again, it's, it's, it is somewhat competitive in that the 4% tax credits are a finite resource, but uh, we haven't run out of tax exempt bond volume cap in Virginia for quite some time. So, um, while there are a couple things in the works that could make it very scarce very quickly, namely rounding up the, the so-called 4% credit to an actual 4% credit, which is probably a little bit too granular to get into in this conversation. Um, there's always been plenty of tax exempt bond buying cap available to fund deals. The reason why it's non-competitive is because it drives roughly 50 to 60% less equity into your deals when compared to the 9% credit. So, that kind of there tells you the principal reason why it's, it's, uh, it's available, it's there, and it's not nearly as competitive. The, uh, in, in our world, the, the primary debt financing options um, for affordable housing are, of course, you have uh, your normal conventional construction loans. Those, those are often provided by any commercial bank that's in the business. Um, the permanent financing, and, and VHDA, of course, provides uh, construction and permanent financing. Um, on the permanent financing side, we've got our agencies, which are Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, uh, very, very prolific lenders in the affordable housing world. There's a lot of advantages to seeking that kind of debt. Um, namely, if you go into Freddie or Fannie with a substantially affordable deal, uh, you get preferential processing on your time frame. Often uh, your rates will be uh, more advantageous than they will if we're otherwise coming in with a market rate deal. So, and, and frankly, they're, they're pretty quick executions. Uh, you could also do a private placement with uh, any number of commercial banks or private, uh, private investors. 
And, uh, and there's entities out there, namely uh, Tom Fleetwood's organization, Fairfax County Redevelopment Housing Authority, which is a uh, active issuer of tax exempt bonds for affordable housing projects. I believe um, that uh, actually, I'm, I might be wrong, but I believe the Loudoun County Industrial Development Authority has the authority and capacity to issue tax exempt bonds in connection with um, affordable housing projects. I can't think of one that's been done recently, but I know they have been done in the past. Some of the uh, local subordinate financing options that are available, uh, Loudoun County's got a, uh, a very active and, and workable program through their multi affordable multifamily housing loan program. You can, um, a lot of information on their various websites on how the application works, the various deadlines and their criteria. Um, thankfully, they've set it up uh, such that when you apply for your loan, this is all in tandem with uh, securing a, a, uh, an allocation of low-income housing tax credits, either through the 9% round or the 4% round, you know, as your, as your deal works. Fairfax County also has a very prolific uh, program. Um, again, very similar. Uh, they've they set it up to be paired with tax credits. Uh, and of course, so there's other lo local jurisdictions that are very uh, active in this uh, effort here, uh, Arlington, Alexandria, uh, Montgomery County, uh, et cetera. But those are the ones really that have the most, uh, most affordable housing uh, funding programs that are available for our kinds of deals. I, I, I again, I want to underscore that what is available today, uh, either through the federal subsidies and in, in uh, capacities through low income housing tax credits and what is currently available in Loudoun County, Fairfax, Arlington, Montgomery County is, uh, is not nearly enough to meet what we need to, uh, to have in order to meet our current demand, much less future demand. So um, while it might sound, um, you know, if I had to guess, frankly, it's probably, you know, a third of what's needed overall, maybe a half depending on how you look at it. But again, I'm always very thankful for what is available. And that's why I put this note at the very bottom of the screen, because these are dollars that are coming out of the uh, public money. They're coming out of tax revenue. Um, you know, the jurisdictions are, are currently challenged, frankly. And uh, so we're thankful for what we have, but it's, it's not nearly enough to get uh, the job done that we have uh, lying ahead of us. Uh, one option that, uh, that uh, I think is widely used here, uh, Tom mentioned it, Nina mentioned it, is the uh, PPEA process, which gives the local jurisdictions the authority to create public-private partnerships. Um, we've done uh, two of these deals in, in Fairfax County. The first one for us was the Residences of Government Center, and the second one was uh, One University, which we just actually officially got our 9% uh, award finalized through the DHDA board uh, yesterday. So we'll be closing on that in about a year. Um, other opportunities that we have, I believe um, some recent zoning changes were published that came out of Loudoun County that I'd like somebody who is uh, deeply knowledgeable about that uh, on the call to chime in if it's appropriate. Um, I also know that there was a real estate tax abatement uh, under consideration at the Virginia General Assembly. I believe that um, it got pushed to the next session. And again, this is something that is, is widely used in other states uh, that we do business. We're, we're, de we're developing properties in 12 states right now. Uh, about half of those allow real estate tax abatement as a financing tool to, um, to cultivate and foster the development of affordable housing. I'm hopeful that uh, this tax abatement will be enacted next year. Again, it's just going to be a modification of the state constitution that would allow a local jurisdiction to forego its portion of real estate tax revenue so it choose to do so. So I think, it, I think it seems to be going in the right direction, but it's not done. Of course, after it passes, then you have an implementation, implementation phase that uh, that'll have to be worked through, but that's coming down uh, the pike in the future. Some of the uh, kind of what I would call perennial consistent challenges that we deal with is, um, you know, frankly, land is expensive and uh, securing extended site control of private developers can be very difficult. Um, 
it's you know com completely uh, understandable that they're profit motivated and they want to get their as much land value for their land as they can as quickly as they can. So that's always a real challenge. Um, thankfully, you know we have uh, public public entities like Fairfax County that are willing to uh, and control substantial amounts of land in the county that are willing to dedicate that to affordable housing. And it's that. Uh, level of patience and site control that makes it difficult for a, a property like one university, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, again, I've, I've mentioned the shortage of uh, funding for affordable housing. That's again, that's a, that's a national, that's a state, and that's a local level issue. Um, of course, you've always got to navigate if you're going for 9% tax credits, you've got to navigate the uh, Virginia housing obstacle course every year, which again is, is a uh, it's a very transparent process. It's probably, again, out of the 12 states that we're actively developing in, probably the best QAP from a transparency point of view that we've encountered. So they're to be commended for their, their efforts in that area. Um, the, the last thing too that uh, in this kind of matrix of uh, challenges is we often have uh, these sources of funds that put up uh, competing priorities. In other words, if you're applying for the 9% tax credit in Virginia, uh, you cannot win without uh, suppressing further the rents on a substantial number of your units well below the 60% AMI level. So while that tax credit is extremely valuable, it comes at, at, at a relatively calculable but uh, high expense in that you're, you're suppressing your incomes substantially lower than the 60% AMI level of course, that's going to suppress your net operating income and then, of course, your the amount of uh, permanent loan debt service uh, and mortgage loan proceeds that can be generated uh, by the property. So it's just it's this constant yin and yang about uh, balancing uh, the priorities of the various funding sources and, and trying to get your deal to pencil. All the while uh, getting the rezoning done, if that's if that's the case, and getting the landowners to be patient throughout the entire process. I wanted to uh, just quickly point out a couple of the uh, recent deals that we have done. Uh, Residents at Government Center, Tom pointed out, is a PPEA deal. It sits out in Loudoun County owned land. Uh, this was actually the first uh, 9 4 twin, conjoined twin deal in Virginia. So we, we broke some new ground in that area. And uh, subsequent to this deal, uh, VHDA actually modified their QAP such that it really incentivized other applicants to follow this type of structure. It's a way of conserving resources uh, on the 9% side. There's a summary of the high level capital stack of the deal. You can see that um, the value of the, the tax credit equity that comes into the deal. So you can see Again, each of these deals were voluntarily restricting the rents of the units substantially below the market. In exchange for that, we're picking up all this tax credit equity. That's covering about 45% of the total capital stack in this particular deal. So you can see that's substantial. And you can also see, you know, mathematically, this deal's 270 units. If we were to, if that tax credit equity were to disappear, that equates to roughly $100,000 a unit of a hole that is created that we have to go find other sources of funding for. And again, when I talk about we're building into a loss, that's, that's the roughly $100,000 a unit I'm talking about. This is another deal that we're closing on at the uh, end of this year. It's called Ovation in Arrowbrook. It's the, the Innovation Metro in Herndon. Another 9-4 twin deal, uh, 274 units we've got about 38,000 feet of ground floor retail. And um, as you can see, it's in a uh, kind of more of an urban design. It's really designed to tie into the innovation metro theme that's going on at uh, the broader Arrowbrook campus. Again, on this deal, you can see the substantial amount of funding that comes in from both the tax credit equity and the subordinate financing. Uh, you're talking 38, plus 8% of the total capital stack is being provided by either through the low-income housing tax credit uh, and uh, Fairfax County through their blue burn housing funds under this scenario. Another example, we just finished this deal over in uh, Shady Grove, Maryland. It's in Montgomery County. 
this particular jurisdiction, again, it's, it's right across from the Metro walkable. Um, it's a 110 unit deal. And you can see here, again, uh, the amount of subordinate financing that's coming into the deal. Now we financed this deal fully with tax exempt bonds. Uh, the county wanted us to do it that way rather than to go into the 9% competitive round. But you can see here, the county put in about seven and a half million dollars, the state put in three and we had another state uh, source of about a half a million dollars. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of things go into these deals as far as assembling the capital stack. Um, this is uh, the most recent award that we have in Fairfax. Uh, again, it made official last night at the VHDA board meeting. This is one university, it's a 3P deal. Uh, to give you an idea of the effort that it takes to get something like this to even today I can go back and we've been working on this transaction for over four years from literally the date we were awarded the 3P effort uh, to the present time, which involved a very uh, extensive comprehensive land use and the rezoning process um, among a lot of other things. But so we've been, we've been working on this particular deal for four years. We're gonna close it in July of next year. It'll be five years. Uh, it'll take two years to build it seven years, it'll take about six months to 10 months to lease it up. So you can see from the idea, uh, uh, the first idea of a development project in this arena, it could easily take six to seven years of uh, full on effort before you can realize uh, the units. That's why it's important uh, to keep looking to the future and building pipeline. That's a little bit of a, uh, Site plan of the site, uh, you can see here is the main campus, George Mason University, here's their field house, and here is the uh, 10 acre site that's gonna house one university, and then on the front side will be student housing uh, owned and operated by Rye Student Housing Development Company. And uh, that's it for my slideshow. Um, just a couple bullets about uh, us and, and who we are and, and what we do. We are, we are a national company, we're privately owned, um, there's four partners in the business. Uh, I'm one of them. We have a uh, equity syndication arm, which raises uh, investment capital from banks, insurance companies, and other financial services institutions. We've raised about $1.8 billion to date. We've uh, grown a portfolio of about 26,000 units nationwide. Um, our development portfolio is active in 12 states. Um, we're our GP portfolio, which is our development for portfolio, is ex in excess of a billion, and we have about $500 million in our closing pipeline. And uh, is that it? I'll, uh, I'll say thank you. Well, and I'd like to say thank you to you, Steve, for um, you know, sharing with us how private developers are working to meet workforce housing needs while working with local jurisdictions. I think that was really informative. Um, right now, it's time for our Q&A session, and I have three questions for our panelists, so if our panelists can all um, be on the screen, and then I'd like to be able to go, we've got a couple audience um, questions, I'd like to be able to cover those, so I'm going to apologize um, if we run over, so I'm hoping that people will stay through the, the program, but we may run over. Um, first question, this one is for you, Nina. We are seeing the beginning signs of regional collaboration as members of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments has pledged to do their part to address the region's affordable housing shortfall. Do you think it's time to begin considering a Northern Virginia Housing Authority to address this issue comprehensively? Oh, wow. I reading the Q&As. I was preparing for those questions. Um, <laughs> well, we love your expert, your expert opinion. Uh, expert opinion. Um, I will say that working with um, Tom Fleetwood has been such a joy and there are tools that come in a housing authority that um, I've seen aren't available in some other municipalities. So we work in Loudoun and Arlington, neither of which have a housing authority. So um, potentially having a regional housing authority would add tools to the toolkit. Um, there is not a lot of money available on the federal side. So I think what what, um, and I should let Fairfax Tom speak to this, but I, I, I think what uh, I see is more creativity that comes out of the housing authority. So it's not necessarily new funding, but, but creativity is an important part of uh, achieving our goals. Tom, Nina mentioned you, do you have any comments? So 
So, yeah, just really briefly, a couple things. Um, you know, I think that in Virginia housing, we have a statewide housing finance agency that is uh, generally very uh, creative and very flexible uh, with whom uh, we've all developed, I, I think, highly effective relationships. Um, you know, the benefit of the of having a local housing authority is that, you know, is that you know, sort of connection uh, that you can make with the local government itself, including, you know, the decisions that get made from a regulatory standpoint. So uh, the the idea of a, of, a, of a regional housing authority, I think, is certainly is certainly an interesting one. Um, but as Nina says, it would you know, it doesn't really necessarily by itself bring new funding opportunities. And I, I have a, a brief comment on that one. Just uh, sure. what I what I what I would like to see is I, I don't know that that would be uh, that helpful, frankly. Um, you know, what I would like to see is, um, for example, Tom's housing authority. I'd like to have him uh, have the capability to travel to another jurisdiction. Just like there are many tax and bond issuers that uh, Suffolk County, for example, they have the authority to travel anywhere in the state to issue tax exempt bonds. Um, Tom's got uh, quite an infrastructure already set up. So I don't know when I hear yet, you know, another, the notion of another housing authority, I hear more staff, more infrastructure, uh, likely a duplication. Um, I'd rather, my preference would be to see someone like Tom's footprint expand not necessarily cover over, but the, the intent here would be to supplement, you know, what Arlington is doing and what Loudoun is doing or, or not doing as the case may be. So, um, you know, because I, I think, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the perspective that we have of developing around the country, I'll, I'll, I'll make a one last point is uh, the state of Massachusetts has over 300 housing authorities. I, I'm not, it's 300. I had to, I had to fact check that one, but they do. And can you imagine, uh, again, each housing authority might be one or two people, but they, and they might have one or two deals, but that is highly inefficient for a state. Of the, I mean, under any configuration, right? So um, I think particularly in a, you know, jurisdictional sense, having somebody like, you know, Fairfax kind of handle Northern Virginia it might not be appropriate for Tom to go to Richmond. There's Richmond has their housing authority in Portsmouth, but certainly I think there's a conversation, an interesting one around him ha expanding his footprint into Northern Virginia. Okay, thank you all for the, that, that sound advice. Um, this next question, Steve, while we have you, um, this one's for you. Oftentimes the creation of a diverse housing options in a community sounds great on paper, but often hits insurmountable roadblocks um, from community backlash. How have you introduced diversity of housing to neighbors who are uncomfortable with it and successfully overcome this problem in the communities you've worked with? So um, I would, I'll give you probably the most recent example and um, would be uh, the, the rezoning at one university was very, uh, very strenuous. Um, I'll say that we had we had to deal with all the issues that you can imagine, um, traffic schools, and then the there was a lot of um, kind of undertone uh, relating to some other issues that, um, and I think you know the way we do it is, frankly, is if someone has a question about how it's going to work and how it's going to operate and how it's going to be managed and what it looks like, uh, our best uh, marketing tool locally here would be government center. If someone has a question about it, um, in, in the landowner, frankly, at uh, Arrowbrook had a question about it. He likes the idea, uh, but there is certainly an educational component that is ongoing um, consistently and persistently that I need to uh, educate people on exactly what, what, af what affordable housing is. And so when I take people over to government center, um, our objective, again, everything that we've developed is to make it look and operate from a market rate perspective. So we take people to government center. Uh, it's our local showcase. Um, they walk around that, they see the amenities, they see how it's being managed, uh, they see how it's being maintained. They walk around the grounds, the parking deck, and they're like, okay, you know, this is, this is, this is really well-built. 
uh, architecturally pleasing, well managed. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, frankly, if you if you look at the people that were housing there on a pie chart, it's kind of exactly who we all were talking about. Nina brought up all those statistics about the retail service workers in Loudoun County and first responders. That's who we're that's who we're serving right there, and that's who needs to be served, right? And those are the that's the the great underserved market. Um, again, every land use case is a little different. Um, we had different issues in Aspen, Colorado, for example. They wanted to make our whole site a park, um, which of course wasn't going to happen. But um, I, I say that the simplest thing for us is education. Uh, and it, it goes beyond, frankly, just talking about it. People want to see it. And the best way to do that is to go out and tour a property. Great, thank you. And Tom, I have a question for you. In 2019, your department made news with a request to add a housing in all policies manager, much like the Department of Health has a health in all policies manager. What was your vision for this position and has there been any progress made towards its realization? Thank you. For uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that we've uh, that we've made a, a tremendous amount of progress. The, we have hired that position. We have an absolutely wonderful housing professional uh, named uh, Judith Cabelli, who is now our affordable housing development manager. And the, the vision, the charge of that position is, uh, is number one, to lead up our work uh, relative to our minimum 5,000 unit goal. Uh, and, and, and coupled with ensuring that housing is considered in particular uh, when the county is planning uh, for public facilities. So the idea of co-locating affordable housing with fire stations, with uh, libraries, et cetera, uh, the, the idea is really to ensure that housing affordability is, con is considered in all of our capital planning. Thank you for that. You know what, looking at the time, Grafton, are you there? Um, I think you have a couple questions that you wanted to ask our panelists from our yeah, audience. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. We've got uh, two questions actually um, from two of our special guests, uh, Delegate Wendy Gaditis and Supervisor Mike Turner. So first is the question from Delegate Gaditis uh, directed towards Nina. Um, the question is members of our Virginia Legislative Black Caucus have told me that they do not believe that clustering affordable housing is the right way to help the community. They have told me that the best results come when affordable dwelling units are interspersed so neighborhoods are diverse in every way. Do you have suggestions as to how these goals might be accomplished? Um, yes, and I think that's a great question and um, many of us in the housing industry really believe in diverse communities, mixed income communities, and there are a lot of ways to get there. Um, one in particular would be to look at, um, and there's tools for this, look at where you've got clusters, for example, of 90% and above um, white elementary schools, white middle schools. Are those communities um, diverse? And is there a way to add diversity to them? I, I think a lot of this starts on the land use planning side. Um, those of us who are doing affordable housing development, we have to work within multifamily zoning, but it's surprising how many communities have huge blocks of single family zoning. So um, Minneapolis just did a very groundbreaking plan called Minneapolis 2040 and one parcel of that, and it was designed to deal with um, racial segregation and the fact that as everyone in the country now well knows, there's a huge amount of segregation and um, lack of opportunity for people of color in Minneapolis. And they said, we are going to rezone our transit corridors and our commercial areas and add affordable housing zones in them. And, and you do two things with that. You add some density to do multifamily dwellings, um, which is useful for renters. Um, but number two, if you designate it for affordable housing, you reduce the land price. So we're not competing on the private market for that when we're trying to, when Steve or I are trying to do affordable housing. So I think that um, that's, that's to be applauded. I will say that a lot of us that work in affordable housing also say it's, it's both and. We certainly don't want to ignore traditional communities of color where there might be um, poor quality housing or housing that needs to be revitalized. Um, but where there's an opportunity, the priority should be 
moving affordable housing into areas of opportunity. Higher income, single family neighborhoods, those should be the targets, but it starts with the land use. Thank you so much. Grafton, do you have another question? Great. Yes, uh, and our second question is from um, Ashburn District Supervisor, Mike Turner. And his question is, for families in our affordable market, which is the 30% to 70% of AMI, should we be focused primarily on expanding and increasing affordability in the rental market or the sales market? Should we be trying to make home ownership more available to families in this income range or is home ownership for this family group unrealistic in Loudoun County? Um, that question was not directed towards any specific speaker, so would love to hear anybody that would like to take a stab at it. I can, I guess, I can offer a quick comment. Uh, we we are purely in the rental business, so it's we we have not dabbled in the or, or entered into the for sale affordable housing space. Um, there's a lot of challenges with that um, when you when you get down into the very uh, lower incomes. Uh, but I think you know I think Loudon does have a WDU uh, you know for sale program that's fairly active, don't they? Maybe somebody from the county can chime in. Uh, Steve, that's a good question. We'll have to follow up on that just because well, folks are here from the county, but their their mics aren't turned on. So, uh, we'll follow. Well, up. And and I can add just a little bit. Congress recently changed the affordable restrictions for low income housing tax credits. It's called income averaging. So you can serve households up to 80% AMI and still use the low income housing tax credit tool. So that's new for us. So it used to be that people between 60 and 80% AMI were kind of left out in mm -hmm. terms of having um, public resources and support. And I will say, you know, in the communities I've worked in, They've often targeted the um, affordable home ownership to more 80 to 120% AMI because those households tend to be more stable and it takes less subsidy and they're more likely to succeed. So wouldn't rule it out, but it does seem like it's a best practice to focus a little higher on the AMI level. And Tom, I saw you reaching for your mic as well. Yeah, I was, uh, I was also just going to note that, um, you know, home ownership, uh, uh, services as we practice them in Fairfax County really tend to focus on households earning uh, from 60 up to 100 in some cases 120 percent of the median income and one of the major challenges uh, that we have with our homeownership programs is uh, that you know so much of the new product being delivered uh, while we might be able to make the uh, the actual cost of the housing uh, be comparatively affordable, the condominium fees uh, pose a major challenge to ongoing affordability uh, for, for people with lower incomes. So as, you know, as Nina so artfully put it, it's kind of both and. Um, we really need a, a, a continued and sustained focus on affordable multifamily rental housing. Uh, that's the most efficient use of, of uh, of uh, public dollars for affordable housing, but we also need to provide an opportunity for low, for more moderate income families to also be able to avail themselves of home ownership. Thank you so much. I know we are at noon, but I just have a quick lightning round question. Um, and before I, I ask that, if anybody is, is needing to leave at noon and you are a sponsor, I wanna thank you so much for, you know, sponsoring this program because I thought that this was an amazing um, program and we hope that you continue to, um, you know, again, join us for our policymaker series during the summer. My lightning round um, question is going to be this. Um, with Loudoun's Office of Housing officially form forming on July 1st, what advice would you share with the team as they forge a new path forward addressing Loudoun's unmet housing needs? Anybody want to take it? Maybe I'll give a shot to that. Um, uh, is, uh, you know, number one, uh, be creative and allow yourself to be creative, allow yourselves to take risks and communicate a lot about what you're doing. And um, just as an aside, please don't hire any of my staff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nina? 
I'll just add, you know, bravo Loudoun County for elevating that position and that department. Um, use that as a bully pulpit, a way to move the community. You, you heard there's a lot of opportunity with things like land use policy, which aren't strictly under housing. Um, but I think uh, the most effective housing directors I know, including Tom, you know, work across departments, permitting, land use, you know, public policy, funding. Um, this is a problem that takes a lot of uh, partners, uh, internal and external. So, um, you know, good luck to you and uh, excited to see what comes next. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I, you know, honestly, uh, good luck. I, I'm kind of with Nina. It's, uh, it's good that you're elevating, you dedicated a position to, to advance the cause. Um, and she said the obvious things, which are, uh, it's, it's across the spectrum, land use, permitting, uh, education, uh, and, and use it as a tool to communicate with the external world uh, frequently, as frequently as you can. Thank you. And, and I just want to give a heartfelt thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for this morning's discussion. I know Zoom is really hard and because you don't get that applause. And I guarantee, because my phone is blowing up with a bunch of texts, that this was a, a really great session. And everybody is so appreciative of your time and your expertise and all that you're doing out there in the region. And so um, we look forward to future um, discussions and um, hope that you'll come back and um, be part of our programs here at the Loudoun Chamber in our Policymaker Series. I would also, again, like to thank, um, you know, U.S. Senator Tim Kaine and our whole audience for helping to shape this dialogue this morning, and also to our, you know, our, all of our sponsors, because again, without you, we would not be able to deliver this type of programming. And um, last but not least, I do want to thank our elected officials for um, being part of this call and the Chamber Board of Directors and our honored guests who all joined us today. I know, as I said, you can't hear the round of applause, but I am giving everybody a big round of applause. So thank you very much for being here and go ahead and have a nice, wonderful um, business afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.